Joined now by the Cardinals president of baseball operations, John Mozeliak. He needs no introduction, so I won't waste any of that time. Mo, it's been too long. I say that from my perspective. I'm not sure about yours. <laughs> Martin, Happy New Year, and uh, glad I could join you. Yeah, thanks for hopping on. Uh, we had recent news with the addition of Andrew Kittredge from Tampa Bay. The Tyler O'Neill trade also brought you uh, Nick Robertson. Were those the bullpen pieces that you were not waiting on, but to kind of fill out your off season? Would you say you're done at this point? No, I wouldn't say we're done at this point. Um, obviously, you always want to leave the door open for whatever potentially could still arise. But you know, we're still paying attention to the free agent market. We want to see how it unfolds. And you know, I, I definitely feel good about what we've been able to accomplish so far. But we know there's still time to do some work. Are you surprised some of those bigger names are still sitting out there, whether it's Snell or Hayter and Bellinger? You know, yes and no. I, I think there is some uncertainty in the industry right now as far as, like, you know, TV contracts and what that's going to look for from a, a local revenue standpoint. But, you know, I also think, it, you know, as you look at the modernization of free agency, I, I do think people aren't necessarily, you know, chasing a clock, if you will. Um, and, you know, a lot of people just sort of think about the off season and, and, and the conclusion of winter meetings as if, you know, that usually wraps up most of the big signs. But I think in, you know, recent history that shows that that's not always true. Obviously there were some big names that went off the board. Um, and Otani to name a few, but like, you know, overall, I think people are still just sort of like trying to assess where they are in the market. And, you know, obviously these guys will all sign before we get there, but it wouldn't shock me to see a name or two get dragged into spring training. And when it comes to Sonny Gray, somebody you guys identified you were interested in, and he obviously said he wanted to be here, but how does how does that play out when he could sign with Atlanta? He could go to another team. How do you manage that sort of waiting game and make sure you get the guy you wanted? Well, I think in our case, we weren't waiting. Um, you know, you think back to Thanksgiving, and that was really the time frame that a lot of our signings happened. And, and part of that was because, you know, all three pitchers we signed, including Sonny, all had a lot of interest in trying to do something here. So we didn't really have to wait out a market or, or see how the market might develop. And so in our case, the most important thing for us at the time was just being ready and being nimble to do to to get a deal done. And so, you know, really pleased with with the acquisitions of of Sonny Gray, Lance Lynn, and Gibson because I think you know all those guys are going to help us. And when you look back at 2023, which I promised myself I'm not going to talk much about ever again, but you know it certainly uh, uh, was a reflection of not having the, the depth and pitching to really get through that season. Do you think Kyle Gibson, not in your world, but I feel like fans and media, he kind of slips through the radar. Lance Lynn, we talk a lot about. He had bad numbers. He used to pitch here. Sonny Gray is kind of the headliner. But I feel like if you look at Gibson's year in Baltimore, that maybe we're not talking enough about him. What, what do you like about Gibson? Well, I like that he has a veteran presence. He's, he understands what it takes to go pole to pole, meaning he's going to take the ball. And, um, you know, he gives you a chance every time out there. I think when you – when you really peel back the onion last year and, and look at some of those starts where we were struggling to get out of the first or second inning, you know, this guy's a pro. He knows what it takes to, to 30 starts, 35 starts in a season. He wants to do that. He's eager to pitch here in St. Louis. So, you know, I think he's a, a below radar sign in, in regards to, you know, people that are maybe not that familiar with him. I, I, I could see that. But, you know, I think when you look at, at how teams are built, you need players that, that understand what 162 over 187 looks like. And, and that's, you know, something I think these guys, they get. How do you look at Lance Lynn's numbers? He probably doesn't want to talk about 2023 either. How do you look at that and say, okay, he won't be that for us? How do you know that? Well, well I, I think, you know, we're confident we can get him back to where he was. I think there's a couple things going on here. One is – you know, he understood some things that were going on with his own mechanics, um, knows he had to make a, a change with that. And then I think, you know, sitting down with our pitching coach, having him spend time studying his video and, and, you know, from an analytical slant as well. But there's some things we think we can do to help him, and, you know, hopefully we can uh, get him to where he once was. But, you know, 
performance aside, this guy's a competitor. He, uh, I know he's working really hard this off season and, you know, he wants to, uh, you know, have success. And this is not where he's someone that's just hoping to, to play out a year. This guy, um, you know, he wants to pitch for, for more years to come and, and, uh, he knows this year is important to, to reestablish himself. You mentioned with Sonny Gray at the time, a lot of people have talked about it since, just his tenacity. I think there's been a Chris Carpenter comparison in terms of approach. Uh, give me an idea, just DNA collectively. Lynn's got an edge. Gibson can bring an edge. This veteran presence, how much in your clubhouse did you feel, hey, we're a little quiet or, hey, we're missing some big voices? Well, I think, you know, and I stated this at one of those press conferences when, you know, you look back at, at this past year and, and you think back to, like, not having the voices of, of Albert Pujols and, and maybe more so even someone like Yadier Molina who had been with us basically two decades, you know, that was lost. And, and so trying to reestablish it is not easy, but trying to inject some veteran presence that understands what it takes to play day in and day out I think is really important. So... You know, I, I think these guys bring that, um, you know, conversations with them over this off season. I, you know, really enjoying what I'm hearing and, uh, you know, super optimistic on, on the direction of where this organization's headed. Now, the only downside to that, they're all veteran guys. Your starting five is, is an older group. Is that risky at all? How do you view that in terms of their age? Um, I mean, I, I suppose you could take the argument either side, right? But, um you know, there, there's no doubt that, that that's an experienced bunch. But, you know, we do have guys like Limitor Thompson. Um, we have Graceffo coming, uh, McGreevy coming. So I, I feel like we have some, some depth there. And, and, like, I didn't even mention somebody like Rom, who was starting for us at the end of the year. So if we need to find some starts throughout the, the season, I think we have the depth to do that. But you're really hoping to be able to count on these, these five guys to – take the ball every fifth day in terms of your everyday lineup is there any scenario where mason win is not the starting shortstop even if he doesn't hit a ton is he the guy day in day out i mean i, I again you never want to speak in absolutes here but you know the, the the door's been open for him you know we use the opportunity that uh, our poor 2023 season afforded us to give him some opportunity to experience the big league level so it wouldn't be such a you know, shock for the first time. And if you really look at his history, he is a, a, a guy that traditionally, when he got promoted, struggled for a period of a month or two, but then things would click for him. And so we're hoping that that learning curve was something we accomplished uh, the latter half of 2023, and he can hit 2024 running. Is Tommy Edmond pretty much cemented into center? I know he's played all over the place, seems to thrive wherever you put him, especially defensively. Is it your hope at least that he is the everyday center fielder and he's not bouncing all over? Yeah, that would be the hope at this point, yes. How else you've had like a consistent three? Is your hope that those three will all kind of take it and run with it? Well, you hope so. And then, you know, Dylan Carlson is also someone that's going to be like fighting for it bad. So, you know, he's having a pretty good off season. I'm excited to see what he looks like. You know, the, we have some depth there, and it's really going to come out to, you know, see how guys perform and, and how they utilize the training is going to be fun to watch. And You know, I, I do like the idea that there is a, a, a competitive element in our camp. You know, last year was a lot different for us because we had so many guys in the WBC. It, it felt more like where we were just, like, getting to see younger players go, but – it didn't feel like everybody was necessarily having to fight for jobs because we knew veterans were going to come back in. And I think, you know, not guaranteeing playing time is not the worst thing in the world. Um, I think on paper, using a pencil, we can definitely write a lineup. But I do think spring training is going to have some value for us this year. It seems to me, based on the off season, the way you guys have approached it, yes, you needed to add pitching. Everyone knew that. But you didn't want to blow it up. You believe in your everyday lineup. Do you look at last year as more of an aberration or a hiccup? Is that sort of how you viewed it? You know, it really never you know, took off. Um, to your point in the outfield, there were injuries. There was a lot of missed time. Um, that group just never really got going. And, uh, you know, we do believe in this group. Obviously, we made a trade to make sure we could create some, some regular playing time for, for the group mentioned. You know, we, we do think it's a, a good, we'll be together for a while. I feel like, 
you know, our infield last year, um, you know, we, we tried to navigate through injuries as well. And, and, you know, having somebody like a Brendan Donovan for a full season is something that's really going to help this club. So, you know, there's some things that, that we believe will, will make us look different, will feel different, and, uh, we, you know, expectations are still very high as we go into 2024. How much do you monitor the division and what other teams are doing? I mean, you're obviously aware, but does that ever impact what you guys do? Um, not really. I mean, we set out, we try to build a club that we think can get us to October. And, and then the plan is, is when we get to October, take our best shot. But, you know, understanding what's happening in our division, obviously you look back to last year, I think that gives you a little bit of a teaser of what's to come in terms of, you know, Cincinnati and, and Pittsburgh are have a young core and building around it. Um, you know, you look at the Cubs, they're still actively in the market and uh you know milwaukee will be something that that'll be of a different interest just because their manager's left he's now in chicago and and see how that comes together they're dealing with some injuries but you know they're excited about their everyday club so the bottom line is you always play the game and you know that's going to determine the outcome you added Haim Bloom, who is with the Red Sox, with the rays somebody i know that you've known for a while explain to folks his role i think some people maybe thought it was more of a full-time gig. Explain to everyone what he'll do. No, it's really more of an advisory role. Um, you know, I, I personally feel like, you know, my, the group I work with day in and day out, we've been together a long time. And I'm not accusing us of being stale. I'm not accusing us of, of not being open-minded. But having a fresh set of eyes come in and, and give us – his thoughts on, on, on really where we are. And, and, you know, he's well calibrated because he, he has been recently with two clubs and two clubs that are really on sort of, you know, polar ends of the spectrum in terms of, you know, a smaller market and a larger market. So, you know, I just want to have a better sense of, of how we should be setting ourselves up for the future and what that looks like. And I think he'll be a, a breath of fresh air for that. Do you feel personally challenged to get this right? You know, for and there's plenty of critics out there. I don't know how aware you are. You always tend to have a little bit of a sense of what the noise is. Do, do you feel any personal pressure, hey, to turn this thing back around and, and how it reflects on you? You know, I get that question a lot. Um, I, I I answer it the same way. I mean, there's always pressure in this job. I mean, that's the nature of it. Um, you know, obviously last year didn't go as planned by any measure. And, you know, I think as a group, we know it's important to, to get ourselves back to, to where our fan base is proud of what we're putting out there. But the one thing I've learned over, you know, over 30 years in this league, it's, it's hard to always make people happy. Um, you know, at the end of the year, only one, one group gets to raise that trophy, and it's it's tough. I mean, that's the, the why people work in this business because they they enjoy the competitiveness and the competitive nature of it. But you know, when when you don't perform, when you don't meet expectations, uh, you know, it can be it can be noisy, it can be loud, and it can be hurtful. But you know, you can't let that distract you from what you need to do to to try to get things right. And you went on record last year. I think we had talked at one point, hey, Ollie's not going anywhere. He's our manager. Does Mr. DeWitt, does Bill ever say, Mo, don't worry about the noise or you're my guy? Does he, does he ever have to do that? Not really. Um, you know, Bill and I have been together a long time. Um, you know, we understand at some point that relationship will come to an end, but hopefully it comes to an end when it's, like, mutually agreeable. But, you know, like, I don't feel like any, like, threatening position i understand we have to win and i understand bill as an owner you know has to get that this product to where our fan base is happy but you know he and i work together we work together well and you know i feel that relationship's very strong and we talked to bill the third last week and one of the questions was about payroll people love to talk about payroll how does that number get determined i think i asked him in a weird way and he said well it doesn't exactly work like that but do, do you come up with a number, hey, I think this is what we need to spend? Or does Bill say, here's the max you can spend? How does that work? Yeah, it really works more like it's understanding what your revenues and your expenses are going to look like. And then we, we sort of backfill in for what the payroll will be. But, you know, Bill, um, Mr. DeWitt and I tend to work in like three-year increments. And so we kind of have a, a plan of what, we want the payroll to look like in those three years. And 
and then I try to manage accordingly. Now, there's sometimes where, you know, something comes up where we may have to go over it, and you know, that's my responsibility. Then pick up the phone and defend why we're doing it. And do you ever kick the tires, even on a big ticket, whether it's Otani or others, just to see? Or is there any value? I mean, would you ever do you kick the tires on some of the bigger ticket items just to see if there's a fit? Well, some of this is relationship based, right? And, and so, you know, depending on who the agent is, of course, I might be in contact with with them, understanding where that market may or may not be heading. Um, so, to answer your question, is you're, you're almost touching base on everything. Um, I feel like that's my responsibility, and so I try to do that on, on just about everything. Now, there's obviously some things that we have zero interest in, so I'm not going to do that. And the Yadier Molina topic finally got resolved, answered. We know his role. But for those who maybe weren't following it closely, I mean, wasn't it clear from him, or at least he wanted to be day-to-day coaching? At least he thought he did, right? Didn't he initially want to do as much as possible? Yeah, when he and I first spoke um, at the end of our season and when he was in here for Adam's um, retirement, it was definitely – something I think that's the direction he was leaning towards. But I think as you start to understand what that commitment looked like, what that time would look like, we came to a point where we realized that wasn't going to work this year. And look, I'm much happier that it ended that way um, because then we can manage it accordingly. Whereas I didn't want to get down the road and have something that happened to us like a year ago with, with Maddie holiday. So it's, it's always tough because, you know, a lot of these guys are trying to balance their family and what their future careers might look like. And, um, you know, we try to paint as clear a picture as possible of what the day-to-day looks like because I don't think players always know what it's like when they sit in the coach's chair because it is a, a much different schedule than what a player is used to. And he could come into town for a homestand, be in uniform, right? not during the game, but pregame and, and be around. Actually, actually now he is uh, – you are able to put coaches, um, even visiting coaches, in uniform if you want because uh, they've, they've kind of opened up the bench and Major League Baseball just got sick of policing who could be on and who couldn't. Our only responsibility is to let the umpires know that we have a uh, instructor in town on the bench and let the visiting team know. Yeah, it's an instructor. Hey, you guys may have heard of him before. I get the sense, too, with the audit. He's not going to be shy, even though he's not day-to-day. Like, if he sees something wrong, I mean, he'll get in somebody's face. I mean, maybe maybe you need that. Well, I don't think it'll hurt. I mean, like, certainly needed it last year. You know, hopefully this group will, you know, kind of grab some things on their own and, and deal with it. But, you know, like, I think having those kind types of voices around is, is always helpful. Well, Mo, we appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on, and uh, I guess we'll see you at the warm-up over the weekend. All right, that sounds great. Stay warm.